please stand for the reading of God's word. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning to all. It's so good to be back here. Good morning, Emmaus Eagles. It is a pleasure to be among you again. As mentioned, I am a graduate of Emmaus Bible College, and I have many, many fond memories of this place. Walking through these halls is like walking down memory lane, except things look very different. The auditorium looks different. The library is unrecognizable. Uh, it looks very different here. But still, I remember so many uh, things from my time at Emmaus. I know you all just had Winterfest last weekend. Yeah, I remember my first Winterfest. Uh, the theme was Lord of the Rings. Uh, and, and I will never forget seeing Dr. McLeod walk through the back of the auditorium as Gandalf. Um, having forgotten every line of his script, but did not forget his Dr. Pepper, which was hidden in his, in his getup, uh, and drinking his Dr. Pepper while making up lines uh, in the script. I also remember the, the, the nights here, the nights with friends. I remember the, lights, the nights in my dorm room uh, with my Bible open, trying to finish a theology paper. I remember, for instance, my first year writing my statement of faith paper for survey of doctrine and being brought to tears as I was articulating for the first time in my own words the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of man. And as I saw Christ magnified and revealed to me in ways I had not seen before, I could not help but respond. My time here was so formative. And I hope that as I look around here that you value the time that you have here. To uh, quote Andy from The Office, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Let me tell you, students of Emmaus Bible College, you are living in the good old days. Enjoy them. Don't waste them. Although these are good old days, I know these days also, when I was sitting in these seats like you, have brought sorrow and hurt and pain. Suffering the passing of loved ones from back home. Learning about your inability to deal with stress or with conflict with friends. This is the reality of life. But it is in these moments that you also learn to cling to the gospel, which is a lifelong lesson. Today, as you continue, we continue our series in 1 Peter, which is relevant to us all as believers. It speaks to how the believers to process trials and suffering, how we do Christian living, as Joel mentioned here at the beginning. One of the themes throughout this letter is the idea of our citizenship, that we're not citizens here on earth, but that we're citizens of heaven. In contrast... To our citizenship in heaven, we are strangers or exiles 
here on earth. We see this right away in verse 1. If you have your Bibles open, hopefully you have your Bibles open. If not, open them back up to 1 Peter 1. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What a way to describe the believers as exiles, not immigrants, not tourists, exiles, strangers. It's a shame that we so easily adopt the mindset of an immigrant in this world. The Bible tells us that we are not of this world, but we readily see the world as permanent, and we desire it more than our homeland. But we're not immigrants here. Perhaps maybe we walk through life as tourists who never really gets involved with the locals. You just stay with your crew. You do what you want to do and enjoy life until you go back home. Peter calls the believers here exiles, an elect exile, not an immigrant, for we know that our citizenship is in heaven, and not a tourist, for we realize that our time being, for the time being, we're stationed here. We need to plant some roots here, but we're not forever here. This theme of being an exile, or more precisely, understanding our citizenship of heaven, is followed in chapter 1 with the verses in which Peter reveals future, present, and past encouragement of God's plan for salvation, or what we call the gospel. So I've titled today's message, The Gospel Empowers. As we walk through our text, we're going to see how Peter moves from a note of encouragement at the beginning of the chapter, rooted in the gospel, to the application of the gospel. He presents three ways, I think, in which the gospel empowers the believer to Christian living. If you'd like to take notes, here's my outline. First, we're going to look at how the gospel reveals our hope in verse 13. We're going to see how the gospel empowers us to holiness in verses 14 through 21. And how the gospel marks us by love with the rest of the chapter, 22 to 25. So before we look at our, at our text today, would you pray with me once more? Let's commit our time to the Lord. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it, it reveals to us your plan of salvation. Lord, and your plan is not only something that we will enjoy in the future, that we know for certain we will enjoy in the future, but it has a major significance for us today. Lord, may you use your humble servant, may you use my inability to magnify your power and grace this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin our passage with, in, with imagery in verse 13. Peter says, preparing your minds for action. If you look at the footnote in your Bible, you notice, you notice that the, the original Greek reads something like this, girding up the loins of your mind. I have never girded up my loins. But this phrase describes what one would do when one was getting ready to work hard or to run, right? Back then, where people wore robes, they would gather the robes, pull it in between their legs somehow, wrap it around their waist to get the excess fabric out of the way so that they can do what they were about to do. That's the imagery Peter's using here. Modern phrase would be like, roll up your sleeves. And he follows with, with a call to be sober, to be focused, meaning don't let your mind wander, right? Listen up. And we get to our first imperative or our first command in this section, in verse 13. Set your hope. And we say, set, your, set our hope in what, Peter? Well, he tells us, on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter is saying, the way you get ready is by keeping the hope on the future hope. The gospel reveals our hope because Christ is the one who saves, and it is Christ who is coming again for his people. So it's as if Peter is saying, begin with the end in mind. Let the reality of what you know what's ahead, your future hope, inform what's about to come next in this letter. So with that context, let's look at the charge. Let's look at the thrust of this, of this passage. Look at verses 14 through 16 with me once more. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy... 
Here it is. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what's the charge? Be holy. This is the thrust of, of, of Peter's uh, message here in this passage. Um, and how do we do that? How do we be holy? What should, the, uh, what should the believer's response be to God's holiness? How do we respond to his holiness? We're going to spend most of our time thinking about this topic because I think it is so important for the believer, especially as we think about Christian living. So let's just ask a few questions here. Let's begin just with a baseline. What is holiness? Hopefully this is review for many of you. Holiness means separated or unique. When God calls himself holy, he means that there is no one else like him. He is different from anything else that he's created. To say that God is holy is not only a reference to moral purity, that there is no sin in him, which is true, but also that his holiness is transcendent. It is unparalleled. There is nothing and no one else like him. So when we think of God's holiness, we should think of both his purity and his uniqueness. Because God is pure and separate from his creation, things like injustice and impurity are repulsive to him. In Leviticus, we find that the sacrificial system gets put in place because God is now wanting to dwell among his people in the tabernacle, but, but sin is present. So they have to deal with it somehow. So the sacrificial system helps people deal with the sin so that God can dwell among them. And there were certain certain rituals that had to occur before somebody would enter the tabernacle and if you did it inappropriately you could die in fact some did god's holiness is to be respected and feared which is what makes the birth of jesus the most magnificent thing about god's holiness where in the old testament only after certain rituals and certain people could enter god's presence otherwise you would die Jesus, the Holy Son of God, comes and his holiness does not destroy us. It heals us. I think of the interaction between Jesus and the leper. In, in Mark 1, 40 through 43, just listen to these words. Mark 1, 40, and a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said, kneeling said to him, if you will, speaking to Jesus, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. He touched them. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. When we look at things like this, this is not what we expect. Nothing else works like this, like what we just witnessed, the way Jesus ministered here. If my wife is sick and I'm around her, we sleep in the same bed, I, I hug her, I embrace her, there's a very high probability that her sickness gets laid upon me. No one here would think that by me touching her, my healthiness would be rubbing off on her. It's the other way around. Her sickness gets rubbed off on me. We don't think anything else. And yet that's not what happens with Jesus. His holiness is imputed upon those that he touch. He heals those who are unclean. He reverses the norm that we all experiences. His holiness heals our unholiness. Pastor J.D. Greer says this about God's holiness. The greatest display of God's holiness was not in his separating himself from us, but in his entering into our sin and corruption and taking it upon himself and putting it away forever. This is God's holiness. So going back to our text, we ask, okay, this is God's holiness. How do we respond to God's holiness? We see in verse 15 that God's holiness calls us for a response. In 1 Peter 1.15, hopefully you're still there, it says, but as he who called you is holy, here's a response to his holiness. You also be holy in all your conduct. The response to his holiness is to be holy in our conduct. And this kind of response, this is a pattern that's not new to Peter. We have seen this throughout Scripture. In Leviticus 11.45, God says, For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is 
the, this deliverance in the lab, land of Egypt is the equivalence to the cross in the New Testament. Uh, so I'm the one who has delivered you from the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Peter is probably replicating the pattern that he has seen in the scriptures of God being the one who delivers and calls his people to holiness. Because he is holy, we respond with holiness. God is the one who has delivered us from slavery to sin, and we belong to him now. So in light of the gospel, in light of the deliverance from condemnation, we live holy lives, meaning that our pattern of life looks different than that of the world. It should be a reflection of the God who has saved us. Remember how God's people are described here in this letter as exiles, as strangers in the land. So therefore, we ought to look different. We should look like we don't fully belong here. Paul describes what this looks like in Ephesians 4. He says, To put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desire. So that's what this looks like. You put off the old self. You identify these things that belong to the old self, and you put them off. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and then you put on the new self, your identity in Christ, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The way our life reflects our Savior is by putting off the old self and, and replacing it with the new self. Understanding that our identity, our union in Christ has now been imputed to us. His righteousness is now our righteousness. His holiness is now our holiness. We stand before a God who judges blameless because of faith, our faith in Christ Jesus. But the call here is, is twofold, right? So the, the idea of holiness is, is there's two sides to this coin. The one side is that God has set us apart. We are his and he is ours. We, we are set apart. We are, set, we are saints is what scripture calls us. The other side of the coin is that we are called to obey the call to holiness. We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. How do we obey that? How do we pursue holiness? How do we do that? I know I'm not alone when I say that I'm a wretched sinner. I have, been, I have been a believer for over 20 years now. And if my life were to be shown on the screens before you in the span of those 20 years, I would be not only utterly embarrassed, but you would want nothing to do with me. So when, I, when we ask, how do we do this? How do we become holy? How do I obey this call? What we're really asking, the root of it is, how do I deal with the sin? How do I deal with it? That's the problem. That's why I can't pursue holiness. Well, the question to how do we deal with sin is answered by the gospel. You see, by faith, I am justified in Christ. And by being justified, being declared righteous by faith, I have been freed from the penalty of sin. When I became justified, I'm also sanctified, which means that I'm set apart by God, but I'm also experiencing the freedom from the power of sin. I have witnessed and experienced firsthand change, transformation in my life. Sin that had a hold of me no longer has a hold of me. And oh, how I look forward to the day of our future hope, to glorification where we will finally experience freedom from the presence of sin. So how do we deal with sin? How do we obey the command to be holy? We cling to the gospel. We cling to our understanding that we have been freed from the penalty of sin, that we have been freed from the power of sin, and that we have a future hope where the presence of sin will be no more. Peter points us back to the gospel in verses 18 through 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He is the one who is without blemish and without spot. And that's what's been imputed to us. 
It is the blood of Christ that cleanses us. Our union with Christ gives us both a standing of holiness and it is God's work in our lives to change. He has given us a new heart. We've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit that brings about this transformation. I am not saying that we reach perfect, perfectness uh, or perfectness to the status of our God. But what Peter's calling us to do and what the rest of Scripture is calling us to do is to obey to the command to pursue holiness without the expectation that we will attain holiness in this world. So we have been given everything we need um, to see life change in our life as we wait for a future glory. The final verses complete Peter's thoughts here of the impact of the gospel on the Christian life. How the gospel marks God's people by love. Look at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Peter says, having purified your souls is a way of saying, as you have been obeying the command to be holy, the product of this obedience is love. To love one another. And that's the last imperative or command in this section. How does, God, how does the gospel mark us by love? God's love for us does not leave us unchanged. In the Psalms, we see mention of God's steadfast love over 50 times. God, God is not only expressing his love for us by his word, but by deed. The most loving thing God did was to provide redemption in a plan for redemption that's laid out and that unfolds in the story of Scripture. Going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, where we're waiting for the serpent crusher who will come and deal with the problem of sin that entered the world. Going to the Abrahamic covenant, where there's a promise to bless the nations through Abraham. The Mosaic covenant, right? Setting up this law that we cannot abide by, but it is an act of grace that God did not just deliver his people like he promised, but he engaged with them to say, I want you to, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And this is how you're set apart from the world. The Davidic covenant, where we see the promise of a king who will reign forever, this story of the gospel, God's plan of salvation unfolds throughout all of scripture and climaxes at the new covenant, the promise to solve the root issue of, of humankind, which is our heart. And he promises to give us a new heart. And then Jesus comes and ultimately fulfills these promises as the one who perfectly follows the law, the one who through uh, the blessing of salvation comes to the world, and by faith we have been given a new heart in him. So this love is revealed in Scripture, and it changes the way we love one another. God has forgiven this wretched sinner and God's love to this imperfect man has changed this man. And I'm certain that it has changed you. God saved me by dying for me. The gospel leaves its mark on us, and that mark is love. So how can I not love? How can, how can I not be changed by his love by loving others? Because he has loved me so. He has not dealt with me the way I deserve. Instead, he has revealed to me his love. So through scripture, God's revelation, we see God's love. And it is the obedience to his revelation that purifies us. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. See, the gospel empowers us. Empowers us uh, because of the future hope. It empowers us to live holy lives set apart for Him. And the, the gospel changes us. And we're categorized differently, categorized by love. The gospel is not just something that we persevere in this life and we wait to attain in glory. No, the gospel has significance for the believer today, for you now. It is the means by which we experience this transformation in this life. Because of the hope of the gospel. 
as you live in the word for however long the Lord has you here at Emmaus, as you pour out over the scriptures in your studies, understand that what you are studying, God's plan of salvation throughout scripture and the rest of the world uh, being unfolded for you in the pages of, of the Bible, as you grow in your understanding of him, know that this is the foundation upon which you will rely on in ministry. You're going to rely upon the gospel in parenting. You're going to rely upon the gospel in being a spouse, in mourning when you lose a family member, when you lose a job. The truth of the gospel empowers us, enables us to live lives that are set apart by God in light of our new standing before him. So, Emmaus Bible College, you are living in the good old days. Do not waste your time here as it will prepare you for what comes after your time here. The gospel is something we look forward to and it is something that impacts you today in the now. It has been great to be here with you again. Thank you for having me. Uh, would you pray with me as we, as we close? Oh, Lord, how needy of a people we are. But, Lord, your word brings us comfort to know that you meet the needs of your needy people. It brings us comfort to know that you want a relationship with us. It is humbling to know that we, you have given us your word that reveals to us your will. You have told us what sin is. You have told us what does not please you, and we cannot obey it. Oh, Lord, you are so merciful and gracious that you deal with the sin problem of our lives by giving us a new heart. And oh, how we cling to the future hope of glory. Lord, as we have this end in mind, may it inform our lives today. May it transform us for your glory as we stay on mission until we wait for your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.